All right, well, welcome back to the Project 2 Aero channel and the Yamaha Turbo S21 build. It sure feels like this is the 99th video on the Cal series, but we still have a ways to go, and, well, the last few weeks have been more of the same. Foam, sand, lay up, sand some more, and repeat. I figure you guys have seen enough of that, so I plan to mix it up on this one and go over some theories and reasons behind the design of this thing. It's a drastic departure from traditional aircraft cowlings, and likely has a few scratching their heads. I'm not here to convince anyone that I'm right or they're wrong, more so just to enlighten you on why I've gone down the path that I have. First things first, this engine is strictly water-cooled. This dictates the need for a radiator, more traditionally found inside the car that you drive every day. I'm by no means the first one to put a water-cooled engine in an airplane, so there's many examples out there from history that we can all learn from. Take, for example, the P-51 Mustang. Designers were deliberate in the design of that cooling system to not only achieve a high efficiency of cooling, but also limit or even eliminate the drag caused by the air passing through the core. It's actually recorded that the system alone is responsible for an additional 15 to 20 miles per hour at the same engine power settings. In a nutshell, the Mustang has its iconic belly scoop down below for the intake for the cooler. It's ducted from there through a diverging duct to the radiator, and then following that it's ducted out the rear through a converging duct. The inlet slows the air down, hence increasing the pressure and lowering the temps a bit. The exit duct speeds up the air, lowering the pressure, promoting as much airflow through the radiator as possible. They call it the Meredith effect, and if you look that up on Wikipedia, you'll even see a picture of the Mustang as a living example of this phenomenon. For a radiator to work, it's got to have air passing through it. And for air to move, there has to be a pressure differential to move that air. In fact, we're all familiar with this concept in its simplest form. The aircraft that we fly leave the ground by the same principle that makes a wing have lift force. It's all based on a fella named Bernoulli and his principle that with the increase of the speed of a fluid, a decrease in its static pressure will also happen, likewise vice versa. We're all familiar with an airfoil and how it works, but the air traveling over the top must simply move faster to traverse the curves of the upper surface, making that area above the wing lower in static pressure. This allows for that lifting force and ultimately the ability to counteract gravity if enough force is generated. Alright, so I promise that I'm done nerding out over that stuff now, but I only mention it to give grounds to my own attempts at replicating some of that in my own design to some extent. I don't expect to actually gain any thrust since I don't really have room for such ducting. And also, we won't be traveling anywhere near the speeds of a Mustang. But let's take a look at what I do have to work with. My engine's pretty small, and it's lightweight in comparison to the Titan engine that the airframe was designed around. And when faced with an opportunity to design anything like this, I was taught that you're wasting your time if you make anything for only one reason. If you can make it serve multiple purposes, then you've got something worth doing. With that on my mind, in order to maintain the center of gravity near the stock target, my engine has to sit pretty far out. But in this case, it also gives me lots of space for coolers in behind it. I've got three coolers to think about here, a radiator, which I've placed by itself on the left side, and then an inner cooler and an oil cooler that I've stacked on the other side since the surface area is similar between the two. This leaves me little room for a super efficient exit plenum, but we have some room to play with on the intake side of things. Airflow over the engine will do very little for cooling, so I don't need the traditional vents on either side of the spinner. This allowed me to make a much more aerodynamic shape more commonly found on turboprop aircraft, with a single intake down below to divide up for all my needs. I started making individual ducts to each core that got bigger as they went, with those diverging Mustang ducts in mind. There is tons of math that can be done to figure out the perfect aspect ratio, but in the end it's all dependent upon the cooling capability of a given core, and well, that's an unknown for me. I took an educated guess at the inlet size, and we'll just have to adjust as we get further into the development of things. I like to call this approach the LAR method. That stands for looks about right. And I'll admit, several aspects of this are done to the point of looking about right to my eye and only influenced by the design works mentioned earlier. So with the pressure side figured out, let's look at the exit side. Like pretty much every airplane, I have an opening at the bottom around the exhaust that will cause a vacuum drawing out air from inside the cowl and I size this opening to be larger than the intake in order to help with that pressure differential across the cores. In addition to that, I have additional extraction in the form of my vent up on top of the cowl. I wanted, maybe even more so needed, to allow the heat to escape from the cowl after a flight when the airflow is no longer causing that vacuum effect pulling it down and out. 
I didn't want anything sticking up from the cowl since being a tail dragger visibility over the cowl on the ground is already limited. This meant that I would inset these vent louvers and needed to ramp down the airflow to meet the vents. While not the traditional use of a NACA style duct, I thought that I'd use this in this case to influence that laminar flow down over these inset fins. I realize this is somewhat controversial and some might even say wasted effort. Top and center of any hood is not a good place for extraction of air. We've already stated that the air moves due to a pressure differential. And well, what's the air doing at the base of a windshield? It's swirling around, all slow, and forms a bubble of high pressure air. I knew that I was treading on potentially thin ice here, so I made sure to put these vents as far forward as practical, while still over the hottest sections of the engine bay. The implementation of the NACA here is just to help keep that flow stuck to the surface and route the air over the vents before it reaches that high pressure air and spoils the effectiveness. I do plan to test these out when I get the ability to do so later on, but for now, just know that I'm aware of the potential changes that could be forced on the design in the future. For now, you can't deny that at the very least, it looks pretty darn cool. And that's pretty much the theory behind the design so far of the cow that you've seen. I do have a couple additional thoughts. One additional perk of making these ducks a permanent part of the lower cow is that I eliminate a potential failure point in having mechanical connections between vents and plenums with the traditional style silicone tubing. Not only would it be hard to achieve the ducks changing size as it travels back, it's not uncommon to have them come off during operation. Now I'm not knocking the millions of airplanes out there that operate like this daily. I just know that in my case the cooling is critical to keeping my engine running. If I can eliminate a failure point, I'll sure take the chance to do so. Here recently I can recall one such event where this exact failure could have ended up much worse than it did. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has followed the Flight Chops channel in their build of their beautiful Vans airplane. They've done a top-notch job putting an amazing airplane together. And again, in no way am I saying this is inferior in any way. Just using it as an example of the very failure I plan to avoid. If I remember right, the oil cooler hose has come loose on that airplane a couple of times, or at least once, and they thought it did a second time. Resulting in maybe not forced but highly encouraged landings. I don't know how long I'd have if I lost airflow through my radiators. But it sure wouldn't be long before temps got way out of hand. One last thing that I wanted to touch on is the incorporation of a radiator fan inside the pressure plenum on the radiator side. I suspect that the airflow from the prop alone will go a long ways towards keeping things cool, but I also know that my setup isn't optimal by any means. This fan will be there to force air through it if it ever needs a little help on the long taxis or even a steep climb out on a hot day. I can always take it out if I decide later on that I don't need it, but for now, it's a good safety measure to have in place. But hey, that's just what I think. I'd love to know what your thoughts are in the comments section below. If I had feelings, I sure wouldn't be posting this stuff for everyone to see, so don't be shy. We all learn and benefit from the conversations, suggestions, theories, and even conflicting opinions alike. So I always look forward to it. As usual, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next update.